Five friends, one magical weekend together. But on this bright day, one of them is headed toward a collision. All that has gone before in her life will clash with all that must come after. It has stood the test of time. God's Book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Presented by Mark Finley. The Hidden Invitation. Okay. Yeah. Guess I'm finally getting it. Everything. God has lavished his grace on us. Just went right past me before. I'm happy for you. The whole thing about Jesus giving up his life. Forgiveness. The cross. Just went right past me before. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you could explain it to me. What? No, you're happy. Felicia, you're a parade. Why should I rain on it? Cass, I, I had to ask questions. I had to struggle. Okay. So Jesus goes through this horrible agony makes a spectacle of his suffering, all the blood and torture. Why? Why, to somehow make up for me yelling at my little brother or cheating on a history exam? I mean, doesn't that seem like a little bit of overkill? What horrible crimes have I committed that require a sacrifice like that? Hmm? And then, then you get the whole original sin thing. What? I have to carry around some terrible load of guilt because Eve handed Adam an apple 6,000 years ago or whatever. How is that fair? Well, I, I guess I haven't gotten that far yet. I'm sorry. I should shut up. No. You know, I'm not against the God thing. Not at all, I sort of believe myself. It, it's just this whole complicated mechanism that God sets up to give the worst kind of people a free pass. It's because they say sorry. It doesn't sound like good news to me. How can forgiveness not be good news? The fact is, though everyone says it's a good place to be, the way to get there can seem forbidding. Sometimes the pardon that God offers somehow becomes a roadblock instead of an invitation. How do you relate to the biblical concept that Christ died on the cross for your sins? Many of us probably nod our head to the idea because it's so familiar. But does it mean something personally? Does it really resonate inside of us. You know, the New Testament pictures the good news of the gospel as something of a parade. It's a procession of grace passing through the world. Jesus introduced it in dramatic fashion. He moved through Galilee and Judea proclaiming the kingdom, sweeping up a multitude, leaving scores of the formerly blind and lame in his wake. Jesus made a big splash and the Holy Spirit made sure that his followers continued that parade. The apostles were privileged to do the works of Christ and spread his grace. As Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. A significant part of that fragrance of the knowledge of Christ is, of course, the fragrance of forgiveness. 
But the New Testament also tells us that this parade, with its special fragrance, produces strikingly different reactions. Paul continues in verses 15 and 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death to death and to the other the aroma of life to life. The gospel isn't always good news. For some, the spectacle of Christ on the cross simply carries the stench of death. For others, it suggests the possibility of everlasting life. For some, the cross is foolishness. For others, it's the wisdom of God. Believe it or not, for some people who are trying to get to God, the cross gets in the way. It becomes a barrier. Well, today we're going to explore the reasons why that happens. We're going to look at how individuals can break through that barrier. See if you can spot the clues as our story unravels. It's based on the real accounts of ordinary people and their extraordinary encounters with God. Hey, Jacob. 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 How does the cross work again? Because Cass wants to know. I thought you guys were into this old gourmet pizza thing. Come on, great spiritual father. I'd like to know. Uh, isn't this whole idea of blood sacrifice a little primitive? I mess up, someone else dies. Yeah, how is that remotely just? Hmm? You guys, it's been a long time now. You sure you want to do this? Yeah. Okay. Cass, you remember back in school you shut down the administration building, right? Well, it was a whole group. Well, you found out that the university was basically a slumlord, right? that they, they had uh, they own property where the rats ate better than the kids. Yeah, it was a very corrupt system and we were all benefiting from it. And what did you demand the school do? Well, clean them up, make them livable at the least. But when it came down to it, you found out that the college didn't have the money for this huge renovation, right? Okay, now, okay, who was it who stepped in? Well, okay, the university promised to give up claims to the property and then, yeah, the government, HUD, invested, I don't know, millions. And now the kids eat better than the rats. <laughs> well, we hope so. Okay, let's say that God wants to deal with this corrupt system called human nature. Now, people have a habit of hurting each other, agreed? Well, God wants us to assume responsibility for our, for our problems. He wants us to see the results of our moral actions. Basically, he wants us to acknowledge the existence of these slums. But we don't have the resources to clean up our act. So the deal is, we have to give up claim on this turf. The turf is our, our flawed uh, hearts and souls. And God steps in with his infinite resources to make the renovation. But how does the crucifixion fit in? What does that prove? It's God's way of staking his claim on the slum stand. He's taking ownership for all the cruelty and all the selfishness in the world. Okay, yeah, you're right. The cross can seem like overkill if you're just thinking about what you did wrong yesterday. But God takes everything on his shoulders. Everything from uh, uh, genocide to, to spouse abuse. And he says, I am willing to absorb the inevitable results of this wrongdoing in my own person in order to give you a clean slate, a chance to start over. And that's forgiveness. See, Cass? Don't you see how beautiful that is? Yeah, theory is terrific, okay? It's wonderful. You're always so pig-headed. Like you haven't been banging your head against a wall about this for months? Why is everybody picking on me? We're not. I just want you to see how beautiful it is to be forgiven. Then tell me, Felicia, why do I feel so condemned? How do we deal with human nature? How do we deal with human frailty? Okay. The cross was designed as the solution to our most basic problems. I believe that when people step back and see the bigger picture, the cross starts to make sense. All that agony and bloodshed at Calvary changed from obstacle to invitation. Let's take a look at a statement Paul made in the beginning of the letter to the Galatians in chapter 1 
and verses 3 and 4. It helps to clarify our discussion. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins, that He might deliver us from this present evil age. Why did Jesus give Himself for our sins? To rescue us, to rescue us from a corrupt system, this present evil age. And that evil includes the moral slums in our own hearts. The cross gives Christ the ability to do that. It gives Him a kind of leverage because He took on human nature. He conquered sin in our place. He absorbed the results of alienation from God. The cross gives Him the leverage to take us to an entirely different age, an age of grace and peace. Here's why. In the book of Romans, Paul explains that the cross was a propitiation for sin, an atonement for sin. How does that work? Jesus died. The apostle writes in Romans chapter 3 and verse 26 to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Jesus' death enabled God to remain just in the face of sin. He didn't just say, it's okay, no big deal. No, he showed that sin results in death. The death of Jesus exposes how terrible sin really is. At the same time, God could become a justifier of all those who place their faith in the cross of Christ. He could forgive. He could accept. He could declare us righteous on the basis of faith. The cross is not a gory spectacle that satisfies some strange divine need to see bloodshed. No, the cross is God Himself absorbing the worst that sin can do. It's as necessary as the cries of a child who's abused. It's as necessary as the grief of a spouse for a lost loved one. The cross satisfies the demands of justice and the claims of mercy. The cross is the most profound statement about love ever made. Listen to Paul again in Romans chapter 5 and verses 7 and 8. That's Romans 5 verses 7 and 8. Perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't give up His Son just for heroes, for the best and the brightest. It wasn't noble human achievement that inspired him to make the sacrifice. God looked into the faces of the cruel and the selfish. He observed the ugliest parts of human nature, and then he decided to take all that on himself. How do we know that for sure? Because those are the faces that stood closest to him at the cross as he was dying. Those are the people who were mocking him as he bled. He was looking at the worst when he stretched out his arms in perfect love and embraced the whole world. Yes, the cross is larger than life. It takes in all of life. It takes in all of human nature, and it makes redemption possible. The cross becomes a wonderful invitation when we begin to see it clearly as the writers of the New Testament saw it. But the sobering fact is this. The human nature the cross was designed to redeem can hide the cross from us. It can hide it in plain sight. It can hide it even when we begin to understand its meaning and beauty. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper to find those barriers within. Hey, sorry about the third degree in there. No, it wasn't your fault. You know, I try to stand up for something and all I get is, whoa, you're not being cool enough. Yeah. Well, we're putting them on there anyway because Cass likes them. Oh, Cass. Yes. You know, she still hasn't changed. You know, she's still fighting for truth and justice. I thought we always admired her for that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. oh really? Did. Yes. <gasps> Do you guys remember the homecoming game and the thing with the mascot and the buffalo <laughs> incident? <laughs> you know, how do you get oppression of American Indians out of that? Tell me. Do not know. Cass was involved? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big time. All right, well, I didn't get to the football games very I much. I didn't get to games much. Well, okay, our, our mascot was the buffalo, right? Well, think about it. The native peoples of America built their lives around the buffalo. They structured entire aspects of their culture around the buffalo. And we, 
wipe out the buffalo. Drove the Indians from their land. And then we're parading around a football stadium, pounding on our chest, leading around this buffalo? No, it's like bragging about genocide. She just wouldn't let it go. I mean, you think our football team mascot was something from Auschwitz. <laughs> so she stole it right before halftime. Wait, Cass <laughs> stole the buffalo? Yes! Okay, I have a hard time believing that. Have you guys met Cass? So we thought we'd make a little statement. You know, free the buffalo. I could still hear those naughty little cheerleaders just screaming at us. And then she started yelling at the cheerleaders like they were concentration camp guards, remember? Yeah, I mean, she had to make a big deal about absolutely nothing. A mascot. Hundreds of years. Hundreds of years of injustice still haven't made it right to the American Indians. Yeah, I do kind of remember Cass always crusading for things, but I always kind of thought it gave her sparkle. Yeah, well, Stanley, maybe that's okay when you're 20, but out in the real world, when you're trying to build a career, and you still have your dukes up? Uh-uh. You've been able to carry that energy into your work now? Well, I just got transferred. You know, don't tell anybody, okay? Oh, man. Bad boss. You know, Jacob, about this Jesus thing, hey, I Ms. really... Hey, Cass, no. I'm not a very good... No. I really do want to understand. But, you know, I've tried to... I've tried to live my life according to principles, right? Not just muddle through. And... That means I can't just fall down at the foot of the cross unless it makes sense for me to do so. Can I ask you something? Do you have a need to be right? Because I'm telling you, sometimes being wrong is actually the place to start. Yeah, I can admit it when someone proves I'm wrong, sure. Cass, it's just that sometimes Seeking forgiveness <clears throat> it requires that we drop our guard a bit. See, everybody's always trying to put that off on me, you know? Like I've got some weird need for conflict or something. No, no, I happen to care about justice, okay? I don't understand why people can't just accept that. Sometimes people assume they have an intellectual problem with the cross, with the atonement. They think the means of forgiveness laid out in the New Testament just doesn't quite add up. But the real barrier is something else, something else that doesn't quite just add up inside of themselves. It's the need to be right on our own. That can be the obstacle. The compulsion to justify ourselves can get in the way of God declaring us just. The Apostle Paul zeroed in on that issue in the first part of Romans. That's his great epistle on the meaning of the cross. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 3 and verses 20 through 22. They help to explain and expand on this idea. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed even the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ. This is one of Paul's great themes. You can't be justified before God by the works of the law. You can't earn acceptance by doing enough. The Pharisees did that by developing an elaborate system of rules and rituals. But today we find other ways to appear better than our neighbor. It might be a fiery campaign for some lost cause. It might be a habit of seeing corruption in everyone and having to expose it. It may be a tendency to argue about little things and try to force the other person to acknowledge his error. These can all be means of justifying ourselves. They prevent us from experiencing the righteousness that comes through faith. But to all those who've been sweating it out, Jesus brings this wonderful invitation found in Matthew chapter 11 and verses 
28 to 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the man who calls us to take up the cross and follow him. His point is that what may seem scary and forbidding is really the way to peace and rest. The way to lay down our burdens is to take up his. The way to be free is to take his yoke. The way to be made right is to acknowledge we are wrong. Pride, fear, insecurity. These are the real barriers to the cross. And Jesus is pleading that we allow him to help us step through those barriers and find the peace of his forgiveness. I can't sleep either. Cass, I'm really sorry about... You weren't really on my case. No. No, I, I said some things about you behind your back. Stupid. I want to be kinder than that. I think better of you than that. Please forgive me. Love surpasses justice. You know, all my struggles for truth and fairness, they never accomplished as much as one little gesture of love. Yeah, I was broken, but the flowers were still there. Yeah, I guess that's the cross in a nutshell, huh? Yeah, I think forgiveness is long overdue. Guess I'm finally coming for it empty handed, huh? Have you seen the wonderful invitation in the cross of Christ? Maybe you've been struggling to put the pieces of the atonement together. Maybe the whole idea has put you off. But I'd like you to honestly consider if the cross isn't touching something touchy inside of you, something you haven't wanted to look at at all. Maybe it's making you react for all the right reasons. Maybe it's exactly what you've been missing all these years. Please come with your fears and frustrations and insecurities held out in your hands. Let Christ take those burdens and take the yoke he offers. Take the forgiveness his sacrificial death makes possible. We're all needy children who need the nourishment of grace. We're all empty in so many ways, and this is the essential food that fills us up and brings us close together. The obstacle of the cross is really what removes barriers when we trust in it. The broken body of Christ becomes a taste of acceptance in the beloved, a taste of eternal life. Coming to that place of peace and acceptance is worth any price. It's certainly worth humbling yourself before a bloodied man who proved his love on Calvary. Why not come with me right now to him in prayer? Why not open your heart to receive him? Why not bring to him all of the needs of your heart as we pray? Dear Father, thank you for giving up your son. Thank you for giving up the safety and security of heaven to come here and absorb the worst that sin can do. We need to share in the broken body of the Savior, Jesus Christ. We need the forgiveness that he offers, the righteousness that comes by faith. We need to stop trying to justify ourselves and let you give us good standing as a gift. Here we are, kneeling at the cross. Thank you for forgiving completely. 
Thank you for giving us a place at the table of grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ, the divine Son of God, entered the arena of human affairs. Can you believe it? For you and me. He paid the price on Calvary's cross that we ought to pay. He died the death that we deserve to die. So rejoice. And until next week, remember, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.